Anyone who studies the philosophies and mannerisms of our ancestors can only be struck by their manly vigor and toughness. Material comfort and mass miseducation have taken their toll on modern Western man, turning him with every generation into a more and more effeminate creature. The ancients knew that without manly courage, political and personal freedom is impossible. One will not take the inevitable risks of living the truth without courage. And today, the great bulk of men of the West do not have the courage to dare to even think the truth. For the ancients, knowledge of the truth meant having the courage to even die for one's beliefs if that were necessary. Effeminate cowardice was, for them, the greatest evil. It is also striking, however, that the ancients did not confuse such manly virtue with anger. Whether one turns to Seneca, Marcus Aurelius, or later Clausewitz, there is consensus amongst the wise. A man may feel anger, but he must be beholden to that dark emotion. One might respond that this reflects the bookish and otherworldly temperament for these philosophers, notwithstanding their military experience. One finds, however, the same insights in that most practical man Xenophon, perhaps the ultimate writer-soldier, making the same point in the Hellenica, or his history of Greece. Describing the Battle of Olynthus in 381 BC, Xenophon ascribes the Spartans' defeat to the wrathful impetuosity of their commander, Teleutius. When some of Teleutius's troops died in a first confrontation, he angrily ordered his forces to retaliate by charging the walls of the city, leading to their coming under missile fire and entrapped by enemy forces. Teleutius died in the battle. Xenophon says, In my opinion, disasters such as these teach men this lesson with regard to anger. One ought not to punish even a slave in anger. For masters who have lost their tempers do more harm to themselves than they inflict. But in dealing with enemies, it is utterly and entirely wrong to launch an attack under the influence of anger and without deliberation. Anger does not look ahead, whereas deliberation is just as concerned with avoiding harm oneself as with inflicting it upon the enemy. Western, ethnic European men have today so much to be angry about. Never before has their masculinity been so shamed. Never before has their people been so dishonored. Never before has their entire genetic and cultural heritage been threatened with submersion and effacement. We heretics know that our genes are the supreme gift from our ancestors, shaped by their triumphant struggles for survival over thousands of years. In our blood is contained their life, their spirit, their hard-won wisdom. How could one not be angry at the thoughtless or malicious prospect of extinguishing this heritage? as though our parents, grandparents, and indeed all our ancestors have lived and struggled and died for nothing. This is a supreme impiety. This alone is cause enough for anger among us. But there is another. The fact is that we are heretics, and that our expression of the truth as we see it provokes a great deal of fear and loathing in a large portion of the society in which we live, who have bought into the established norms, the reigning post-war civil religion of raceless equality, and, we now realize, the end of European nations. We believe the truth about race and heredity and of the righteousness of Europeans fighting to preserve and cultivate their unique genetic and cultural heritage. The media and cultural gatekeepers, who either for reasons of ethnic hostility, effeminacy or miseducation, who have been dragging our people on the downward path, have seen their power shattered. A new mimetic reality is emerging, both good and bad in which the ability of institutions to set norms is decreased, and individuals can seek out whatever culture resonates with them. In particular, the fraction of our people in whom both the scientific truth and ethnic self-interest resonate will consolidate into an ever stronger subculture and movement. Further, we must come to terms with the outcome of 1945. In terms of manly virtue, things are infinitely worse today than they were in the 1930s. The greatest generation, tragically, was already too weak to prevent subversion by a foreign hostile elite while being dragged down by their decadent wasp political class. And how much more feminine we are than our grandfathers, first in the classroom, then in the job or welfare office, then in soft retirement with an ever-growing share of the time spent staring at screens. What is the average Western citizen today compared with the Greek hoplite citizen, the Roman pater familias, or indeed the old yeoman farmer? All of this can be very humbling. The lesson to all of it is that a frontal assault will not yield results. In that case, to what extent can we speak and live our truths without provoking unnecessary anger in our own people? To what extent can we overcome anger in ourselves? The European nationalist movement is really in its bare infancy concerning the care for our souls and the cultivation of spiritual harmony. By hardening ourselves to cold facts, 
by increasing our in-group awareness, by celebrating our historical achievements, and by planning a future that is zero-centric, we can overcome those forces that seek to undermine and eradicate who we are.